Good evening, Rowan. It's the 27th of February 2016 and it's about 2am. So it's quite late, but I thought I'd better make you this video um, once again to reassure you I wouldn't be make I wouldn't be seducing any priests over the weekend. <laughs> I will be making some more Yorkshire puddings, uh, but you'll have to make do with a video I've already made for you about that. So, I thought we could have another little chat about your lecture on faith and development uh, in which you didn't so much come out of the closet on the New World Order. Uh, you blew the closet to smithereens and the fragments of it have never been found. Um, so you won't be hiding in there any longer. <laughs> anyway... So um, that, w that was about 15 minutes into the lecture that you did that, but it was my favourite piece and I just couldn't wait to use it. But So now I'm going back to the beginning and I'm talking about the introduction where you set out your stall and you say what you're going to be talking about and you're using your very posh lecturer voice for this lecture and using techniques of your neuro-linguistic programming uh, to try and give you give your audience the impression um, that you're imparting some fantastic insight and information to them uh, where as usual um, you just fill in their heads full of globalist propaganda and impressionistic crap like you normally do so here we go this is what you say the last few years have seen definite shifts in attitudes to religious faith among those concerned to find paths out of poverty and powerlessness for the majority of the world's population. So who are the people who are concerned to find paths out of poverty? Who are these people? And why are the majority of the world's population in poverty and powerless? Why are they powerless to change uh, the circumstances of their poverty? What is the reason for that? You haven't explained it, have you? Um, because you only want to promote communism and the redistribution of wealth from Western nations um, to third world nations so that they... Um, dictators of those nations who are living in luxury um, can hand it out to their family and friends and leave all the poor people probably in even more poverty um, so that seems to be the strategy so anyway uh, you go on to say but these shifts have not been simply in one direction on the one hand there has been a belated recognition that the majority of the world's population does have religious convictions and to ignore these is to push against the grain of societies that you're trying to help and support. Well how would it be possible um, to overlook the fact that people have religious convictions especially in places where it's quite obvious because it's the, the style of dress and um, attendance at religious worship and the practice of um, religious rituals in the home and the education of children and so on how would it be possible to overlook the fact that people have religious convictions it just doesn't make any sense religious faith is a sheer fact about these contexts and it's thus also a potent force in civil society often the only effective and sustainable society network that exists especially in areas affected by conflict uh, so you're inserting the word sustainable here aren't you it's a word that you use an awful lot and I think it's part of your remit to be indoctrinating people with the idea of sustainability uh, which is why you use this word uh, which is not a common word in English really and was hardly heard of until recently um, but it's programming people to accept sustainable development, um, which is Agenda 21. Sustainable development, um, if you just take the words, the concept of it, sounds like a pretty good idea. Who doesn't want sustainable development? It's only when you look into what Agenda 21 actually is that you realise it's... Um, it's not development, it's regression. 
for the majority of the world's population anyway. These idiots, uh, the global elite, they think they're going to merge their mind with machines and become super beings and become gods. They're all completely mad. That's transhumanism. This is what their goal is. They get rid of all of all who they think are inferior and inadequate and eliminate us from the gene pool. Um, and then they merge with machines and become like gods. This is what they believe. They're complete lunatics. <laughs> Anyway, you go on to say, what's more, if freedom of religion is an aspect of human rights, how you actually handle the religious practices of communities has to be a part of a global understanding of development. You can hardly leave it as the one form of development that a developmental agency doesn't care about. I don't really know why development agencies would have to be interfering in people's religious practices anyway. Um, it's got nothing to do with them. If people need help, then you find out the help that they need, and then you see what you can do to help them get what they need, or to provide it for them. Um, you don't need to be interfering in their religious practices. It's got absolutely nothing to do with you. At best, communities of religious conviction have the potential to be serious and effective allies in the struggle against privation. But on the other hand, there is a long-standing suspicion towards faith in many quarters of the development establishment, accentuated in recent years by a number of specific issues and coloured by the current nervousness about religious extremism. Well, first of all, you don't say what the specific issues are. A number of specific issues. This is an impressionistic statement. It doesn't mean anything. And then you say, coloured by the current nervousness about religious extremism. Um, well, would people be nervous um, about religious extremism because they think that some Muslims hijacked some planes and flew them into buildings in New York? And then there's a lot of people going around keeping that memory alive um, in people's minds and providing propaganda about it and stories to emotionally tie them to this event uh, which has nothing to do with the majority of people anyway who are not personally involved in it but it's constantly been rammed down our throats and we've been emotionally manipulated by it uh, so is that why people are worried about religious extremism then? Um, because slime balls like you um, are telling lies about what the people in other religions do. Um, and also the second point I'd like to make is that I think selling your soul to Satan to get what you want in this life, I'd class that as religious extremism, by the way. So you go on to say, religious communities don't begin from a clear enlightenment doctrine of universal liberties. So they're not enlightened, then you are, and they're not enlightened. <laughs> and anyway, I'd just like to know where my universal liberties are, I don't seem to have any. <laughs> you never gave me any liberty, did you? you? Well, you were trying to liberate me, weren't you, uh, from... Um, patriarchy, capitalism and heteronormativity um, but somehow you never managed to achieve to, liberate, to achieve liberating me did you? So here I am still unliberated. Anyway moving on. They are necessarily exclusive in the sense that they are committed to particular beliefs that not everybody shares. There's always going to be the shadow of suspicion that they will favour their own instead of working for universal benefit, or that they're using aid and development as a vehicle for propaganda on behalf of their convictions, a cloak for proselytism. What, you mean like forcing population control measures on third world nations under the guise of maternal health? Oh no... That's not a religious organisation that does that, is it? That's the United Nations. Oh, and then 
do you mean like saying um, that you have to implement a program of birth control otherwise we're not going to give you foreign aid or disaster relief is that what you mean oh no that's the US government oh well I don't know what you mean then in relation to um, religious aid agencies <laughs> because obviously religious people are the only people with prejudices and corruption and uh, unenlightened and the state is the perfect embodiment of every virtue and good value um, that you could imagine <laughs> and they're not controlled by the global elite um, implementing policies for the benefit of those people and not for their citizens or for the citizens of other nations so you go on to say and they may for example disagree about what universal benefit might mean for example in the area of reproductive rights and liberties well i have noticed that you tend to give examples uh, which are actually the crux of the matter uh, because <laughs> This is really the crux of the matter. I mean, a lot of foreign aid, I mean, as I've said, a UN intervention in areas which is supposed to be helping the people and alleviating poverty, this is what they say. And we all have to pay lots of money to be members of the United Nations. And uh, then they go and really force um, population reduction measures principally on third world countries they don't have to force them on us in the west anymore we're so indoctrinated we do it ourselves <laughs> anyway <laughs> for example in the area of reproductive rights and liberties and also i mean reproductive rights these days is always taken to mean uh, that you've got the right to restrict the number of children that you have um, whereas already having the right um, to have as many children as you want shouldn't be taken for granted because if you give the state too much power they can take that away as they did in China so you go on to say the development agency may come to say liberation as a positive obstacle sorry I've read that wrong the development agency may come to say religion as a positive obstacle to liberation. So you go on to say the development agency may come to say religion as a positive obstacle to liberation. Well liberation from what? This is an impressionistic statement. You're supposed to be speaking on behalf of um, religious communities in a lecture like this. And in fact, you're just reinforcing the view that religion is an oppressive force in the world. Um, and this, this secularist state intervention is the liberating agency, um, when more often than not it isn't. It's a more oppressive force than any religion could ever be. Um, taking away people's rights to think freely and to choose who to marry and if they marry and to own land and all this kind of thing the state is a far greater danger um, to human freedom and safety and liberty than any religion could ever be it's when you get the religion and state merged um, but you start having problems and this is exactly what would happen in the new world order and worse than that it would be a totally false religion with no truth in it at all uh, that would be imposed on everybody which is environmentalism anyway you go on to say and the result is quite often a standoff between what can look like two sets of absolutisms traditional faith and a passionate enlightened universalism um, so you're undermining the idea um, that 
um, religion or religious faith, traditional faith, is in any way enlightened or of a superior understanding to the secular world view, um, which is a perfectly okay position for an atheist to adopt, but you were the Archbishop of Canterbury and you're supposed to be presenting a different view. Um, traditional faith, a standoff between two sets of absolutisms, traditional faith and a passionate enlightened universalism. Well you've set out your own attitude there, haven't you? Um, that you think traditional faith is unenlightened and that enlightened universalism, as you call it, which isn't universal, <laughs> actually, but I won't go into that now, um, but passionate enlightened universalism, that's the thing to be aiming for. Um, you need to be a universalist, don't you? Because if there's any um, suggestion that you might be judged and condemned for your evil behaviour, um, then um, you have to push that away from you because you can't cope with it because of your extreme narcissism. You have to believe that you're acceptable um, whatever you do and whatever your attitude is. So anyway, this is the last paragraph now I'm going to comment on today, the end of your introduction. Faced with the rise of aggressive religious conservatism, I don't myself think the word fundamentalism is very illuminating here. That's an interesting word, illuminating. All this long-standing unease becomes more sharply focused, combined with governmental reluctance to be seen as favouring specific communities and their convictions. Um, no, they only favour the people who pay them off, don't they? <laughs> They favour the people who bribe them. <laughs> they wouldn't be favouring a particular religious community unless they happen to be the ones who were bribing them. The rise of aggressive religious conservatism, you say at the beginning of this, faced with the rise of aggressive religious conservatism. Well, I think what you mean by that is a bunch of people come along to some religious people and say, oh, well, we know a better way of doing it than this way you've always done it and that you like doing it and that you don't want to change doing it. We know something better than that. And then the religious people say, sod off. And then the enlightened people say, no, no, we really know best. You ought to change. Stop doing this. Start doing that and so on. And the religious people say, no, we don't agree with you. Sod off and stop harassing us. And then you call that a rise in re aggressive religious conservatism. Because anyone who resists you and your agenda um, has a whole stack of um, undesirable traits in their personality and behaviour um, which you label as aggressive in this instance when it's actually defensive um, because you're the person who's attacking, so to speak. So stop harassing the religious people with your bullshit agenda and you won't be faced with this so-called aggression, will you? They're not interested. Sod off. <laughs> and that goes for me as well. You can call it aggressive religious conservatism, can't you? Because you have accused me of not being able to cope with opinions other than my own uh, when it's you who's uh, going around trying to force the globalist agenda on absolutely everybody and exterminating anyone who gets in your way. <laughs> so, you go on to say... Um, oh, you think that you think the word fundamentalism is you don't think the word fundamentalism is very illuminating here. So illuminating um, is quite an interesting word, isn't it? But I won't go into that now. And then you say all this long-standing unease becomes more sharply focused, combined with governmental reluctance to be seen 
as favouring specific communities and their convictions. Um, governmental reluctance to be seen as favouring specific communities and their convictions. Well, no, I mean, if governments favour anybody, it's usually the people who are bribing or blackmailing the politicians, isn't it? Those are the people who are being favoured. <laughs> oh, no, of course. The state's perfect, isn't it? And it's religious people who are backward and bigoted and oppressive and all these kind of things. Um, and the state's perfect and we should all look to the state for our values. Uh, despite the fact, um, you know, that the the state uh, was responsible for the Holocaust um, and responsible for enforcing slavery and all kinds of hideous things that were all quite legal, um, the state um, imposed apartheid in South Africa. Um, but it's the government um, that um, is now suddenly. Um, transformed into a benevolent entity. Uh, the state is now a benevolent entity um, not wanting uh, to be showing any favour to any particular religious group and this is all because of their enlightenment and progressiveness uh, and superiority. <laughs> and not for any other reason. Right. Um, so the governments don't want to be seen as favouring specific communities and their convictions. And this can produce a standoff between governments and faith groups that has the effect of shrinking the possibilities of creative cooperation. I'm not even really sure uh, what that means. It's just an... In you give very impressionistic statements. You don't give examples so that people actually know what you're talking about. So you listen to one of your lectures and the, there's very little in the way of real facts in them. Um, you just try to give the impression that you've got some deep insight into a wide variety of areas. And in every area in which I'm an expert, which I've said before, you talk nothing but crap. You misquote people. You blatantly lie about what people have said and what sacred texts say and so on. Um, it's just not possible to believe anything that you say. Um, you've excluded that possibility uh, from the options that are available because you talk so much crap. Um, and when you're not blatantly lying, then it's just impressionistic crap uh, that you're giving and you're not actually imparting any facts at all that can be um, validated or um, discarded uh, because you're not really saying anything at all. So those are my comments on the introduction to your lecture um, and I'm going to um, put the clip of this part of the lecture, the introduction in now. And since I mentioned Tony Blair um, in my last video. He did have a dialogue with Tony Blair, I think that was in 2012, around that time anyway, um, and I have watched the whole thing, which is about an hour and a half long, uh, so I've attached um, also some of my favourite quotations from that lecture. <laughs> from you actually, I haven't included any of his quotations, I could do that another time um, but um, anyway I've put these clips on my favourite uh, quotations from you in this dialogue that you had with Tony Blair um, so I'll leave it there for now but I'll be making my usual Sunday evening video to reassure you I haven't been seducing any priests over the weekend and don't think I'll be proposing to you on Monday either, just because it's the 29th of February. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Hasta la próxima.
the last few years have seen definite shifts in attitudes to religious faith among those concerned to find paths out of poverty and powerlessness for the majority of the world's population. But these shifts have not been simply in one direction. On the one hand, there has been a very belated recognition that the majority of the world's population does have religious convictions, and that to ignore these is to push against the grain of the societies you're trying to help and support. Religious faith is a sheer fact about these contexts, and it's thus also a potent force in civil society, often the only effective and sustainable civil society network that exists, especially in areas affected by conflict. What's more, if freedom of religion is an aspect of human rights, how you actually handle the religious practices of communities has to be a part of a global understanding of development. You can hardly leave it as the one form of liberty that a developmental agency doesn't care about. At best, communities of religious conviction have the potential to be serious and effective allies in the struggle against privation. But on the other hand, there is a long-standing suspicion towards faith in many quarters of the development establishment, accentuated in recent years by a number of specific issues and colored by the current nervousness about religious extremism. Religious communities don't begin from a clear enlightenment doctrine of universal liberties. They are necessarily exclusive in the sense that they're committed to particular beliefs that not everybody shares. There's always going to be the shadow of a suspicion that they will favor their own instead of working for universal benefit, or that they're using aid and development as a vehicle for propaganda on behalf of their convictions, a cloak for proselytism. And they may, of course, disagree about what universal benefit might mean, for example, in the area of reproductive rights and liberties. The development agency may come to see religion as a positive obstacle to liberation. And the result is often a standoff between what can look like two sets of absolutisms, traditional faith and a passionate, enlightened universalism. Faced with the rise of aggressive religious conservatism, I don't myself think the word fundamentalism is very illuminating here, all this long-standing unease becomes more sharply focused. Combined with governmental reluctance to be seen as favoring specific communities and their convictions, it can produce a standoff between development agencies and faith groups that has the effect of shrinking the possibilities of creative cooperation. I see the extent to which people of faith feel victimized or marginalized. I'm not sure they always see it clearly. But I'm just a little wary of jumping too quickly into the victim posture here. Um, as a matter of fact, we have as religious communities, we have access to the public sphere. As Tony has said, we can be visible and audible in public discourse. And I would say that over the last, I don't know, the last decade or so, the recognition that religious motivation is really significant across the board for an awful lot of people has made it perhaps a little bit less disreputable to talk about some of these things in public than once it might have been. The problem of most interfaith dialogue is you're talking to the people who are ready to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. And how you get to talk to the people who don't want to talk to you is, of course, a major challenge. Um, there are different kinds of dialogue and different kinds of engagement. And there's virtually nobody that I, I would feel we ought not to talk to. <laughs> but there are questions, I think, about how much legitimacy you want to give to some groups if there are groups, if there are groups who have what you might call a proven record of internally abusive or corrupt behavior. You don't particularly want to deal particularly with a leadership 
that is compromised by a solid record of bad behavior. And we know there are some religious groups like that. I guess some would draw the net quite widely there, but um, that's, that's my baseline, I think. If there is a group where there is, as I say, a proven record of internal abusive or corrupt behavior, I would not want to give any extra credence to that by publicly engaging, sharing a platform. On the other hand, there are other kinds of dialogue, there are other kind, kinds of more private engagement. We find ways of doing that. It's always important to see yourself through other people's eyes, bishops or anybody else. Um, is there a difference between public and private morality? I don't think there should be, in the sense that what we think a good person looks like should not be unrecognizably different in the public or the private sphere. <laughs>